Paul Baroness Fox of Buckley. Uh, in my short time in this House, I've been hugely impressed by the fairness, clarity and reasonableness of Baroness Jones of Mill School. Oh. Yeah, she might find that that might be uh, bad for her reputation. But anyway, even when we haven't agreed. However, in this instance, I'm sad to say that I can't find anything reasonable in this amendment. But it does raise some broader issues about the bill that still worry me, so uh, I, I, I'll make those points. This amendment effectively argues to deny the right to be a parent to anyone accused of the abuse uh, offence. Enlisting who will be denied unsupervised access to their own children, we have those awaiting trial, on bail, on bail for or involved in ongoing criminal proceedings all of which, as anyone who knows anything about the criminal justice system, can be months or years of one's life. And so that would mean that innocent people, accused, are treated as guilty already. Of course we all want to protect children from any risk. And, as the noble Baroness has illustrated, those horrifying stories of children being hurt or even killed, as revenge sometimes, are probably at the front of our minds. However, two points. The amendment talks of ensuring the physical safety or emotional well-being of the child. I think those are two very distinct threats. The latter, at least, is very difficult to pin, pin down. But I'd also argue that being deprived of free time with one's parent, free from a court-approved third party, could also be the cause of some considerable emotional stress on any child. And yes, I think it could be a recipe for parental alienation, she mentions. Secondly, even the prospect of the fear of physical uh, safety or physical threat cannot distort our sense of justice or lead to disproportionate or punitive measures in a risk-averse what-if scenario that could too easily lead to the state unjustly alienating children from an accused but not found guilty parent. Surely evidence and facts are key here to establish the level of threat. And yet I note that the amendment would deny unsupervised contact, quote, pending a, a fact-finding hearing, which rather makes a mockery of establishing facts and tears off any commitment to factual evidence as an important part of the judgment of whether an accused parent can be trusted to care for or parent their children without third-party supervision. I'm even worried that in this amendment it's argued that the unsupervised contact would not be allowed for anyone with, quote, a criminal conviction for abuse. Granted, in this instance, the evidence has been weighed and facts established, but consider the implications of this. This amendment would mean that someone found guilty of abuse, perhaps as young as 18, could find themselves at the age of 38, by now, by the way, potentially a reformed character, we'd hope, in a different set of circumstances, may be no longer drinking or on drugs or mentally ill or things that we've heard about today, or just shamefaced about their younger selves' abusive behaviour. But that person would still be denied unsupervised access to their children. And to be honest, that seems ungenerous, even barbaric and vengeful, and would suggest that we are branding people found guilty as perpetrators forever, branded with the letter A for abuser. We've also heard earlier today that one can gain a criminal conviction for abuse for breaching a domestic abuse order. And to be honest, that might be a relatively minor offence based on that breach. I worry that this amendment and aspects of it encourage a lack of perspective, a disavowal of making judgments of different types of threat, because I know that the government continues to stress that they don't want a hierarchy when we discuss abuse or harm. We've just heard the noble minister discussed that. But this can lead to a muddle when it comes to parental contact. I think I want to av encourage avoiding a lazy one-size-fits-all approach. For me, when considering risk to children, there's a distinction between, for example, the perpetrator of regular systemic violence or coercive control and the particular emotional or psychological abuse that one partner might inflict on another in a toxic relationship. The latter, at least, may be horrible if you are on the receiving end of it, worse than horrible, but it may never be aimed at children or even witnessed by them. So, to conclude, I urge the government to maintain the presumption of parental contact, and this should only be curtailed or removed with great care. That does not mean putting children at risk, but it does mean 
holding dear to uh, justice. I call the next speaker, Baroness Butler Sloss. My Lords, I entirely agree with the noble lady, the Baroness Fox. I recognise the good intentions of this amendment, but I am very concerned that it is too rigid. As I know from my own judicial experience, not all situations are black and white. As I've said at some length a previous occasion on report, judges and magistrates will get specific training on the Domestic Abuse Act, and the effect of this amendment would, prevent, would deny both judges and magistrates the important judicial discretion. I'm particularly concerned about that because the evidence of abuse relied upon under 2D of this um, clause amendment uh, requires it to be looked at. Um, let me have a look and see. Evidence of domestic abuse may be provided in one or more of the forms accepted as evidence for legal aid, as per the guidance issued by the Ministry of Justice. As the noble lady Baroness Fox pointed out, this means a decision is taken that a father, or generally a father, but sometimes a mother, would be forbidden unsupervised contact based upon the uh, information provided by one party and before the fact-finding decision has been made by the judge. So although I understand why this is being put forward, uh, I would not be prepared to support it. 